Chapter 101, C.U. Their residence, Ava's house, was completely empty. It was a bit alarming, but not in the sense of a life-threatening crisis. Ava wasn't in trouble. But Dirk really wanted to see her. There were very few important people in his life, and she was one of them. So he went to find her after getting the address for the house. As for Cecilia, she went to go find Alec who probably knew her whereabouts. It wasn't long before Dirk arrived. Since his father said it was barren, he decided to walk right into the front door. That's when he saw it. No furniture, no decorations, no rugs, and no signs of life. There was nothing but outlines of dust on the floor. So Dirk searched the house. And he found nothing. It was an entirely abandoned house. Right when he was feeling panicked though, Cecilia arrived. I have bad news. She approached him who sat on a staircase. It seems, they left. Ava had come back from a dive only a few days ago. And yesterday, the family suddenly vanished. Alec's father told me they had suddenly decided to pull out of the empire. They even brought along their business. Why? The war. The entire empire has been worried about the tensions between us and the Dark Kingdom. It's gotten really bad recently. After all, our troops are practically lined up to fight. And, the last time a war broke out, it didn't end well for anyone. Dirk was silent. He understood how devastating a war could be. But it wasn't like Ava was in the military. As far as he knew, her father was just a businessman. But it seemed like there was more to the situation if he left at the signs of battle. So where are they? There's only one place they can be. They're taking a route to go east, which means they want to pass underneath the Dwarven Empire. Since they're hybrids, they're likely heading to the Unity Empire. How fast? If it's a full-scale migration, then even though the wagons might be fast, the logistics ensures it won't be. They've been traveling for 14 hours. Come with me. Cecilia suddenly waved after giving him the details. Dirk looked at her before standing and following. They headed toward a certain corner of the capital. Here, there was a military installation. Cecilia walked right in, and nobody stopped her. You've never actually learned how to ride a horse, have you? I have some idea. I'm sure you could learn on the fly either way. As she said that, the two walked into a stable. Inside were long rows of horses of all sizes and colors. Some looked almost like unicorns while others swirled with large amounts of mana. Cecilia stopped at one of them. It was an all-black horse whose glossy hair emitted a black fog. Dirk could feel the dark element from it. I've been using this horse recently. He moves faster than you think, so you'll need to stress yourself to use his full speed. That also means he'll get you to where you need to go quickly. He can also hide well, and you don't need to worry about losing him. He'll follow you. Anyway, take it. Now? The longer you wait, the farther she gets. Cecilia smiled at him. Dirk scratched his head before looking at the horse. At that moment, Spite also appeared. She looked into the horse's eyes from Dirk's shoulder. The horse seemed a little distressed at Spite's appearance, but bowed its head. Spite walked onto it from the nose until it sat on its back. Good horse. She seemed smug, to which Dirk smirked. He then jumped onto the saddle. Don't be gone too long, or I'll worry. I won't. Go. Nay. The horse let out an energetic sound at Dirk's command. Like that, he walked out of the stable and toward an exit not far from the military installation. Cecilia watched as he and the horse rode off into the distance as if flying. A trail of black fog was left behind. Damn you're fast! Dirk shouted a bit excitedly. The horse flew down a rough road at the top speed of some cars. Dirk's man of vision was stressed as he kept up with the changes in the surroundings. Luckily, the horse also knew how to steer itself and not blindly run into a tree. 148 miles per hour best part was, the horse didn't stop. Dirk had ridden this thing for three hours already, and it never even slowed down. It didn't even look tired. 
Dirk was getting tired faster, in fact. And he was happy about that. Because a bit before the fourth hour, when the sun was high in the sky, Dirk saw it. A massive caravan taking up nearly the entire road. Each of the wagons was five meters tall and up to twenty meters long. Guards sat on top of and within each wagon, and there were some riding horses all around it. It was a full escort force, a necessity with the quantity and quality of the cargo that was being moved. Dirk slowed down upon seeing the caravan. Both he and the horse activated their stealth abilities, and they remained hidden. Then, Dirk steered the horse into the forest beside the moving caravan. The caravan itself was moving surprisingly fast. They were going the speed of cars, around 60 miles an hour despite the rough road. It looked like they had suspension and special wheels though, enabling them to move so fast. If Dirk used his full strength and some magic, he might be able to move with the caravan. But the horse was a much more suitable option, a powerful animal that could go the speed of a sports car for hours on end. Unfortunately, because of the guards everywhere and how fast they were moving, Dirk wasn't able to find a way onto any one of the wagons. He didn't even know which one Ava was in, or if she was alone. So he waited. Dirk tailed them for several more hours. When the sun began to set, the carriages slowed down. Dirk watched as they stopped and set up camp. He also stopped, watching them nearby. Some guards remained as sentries, but he could deal with that. He kept his eye out. But Ava never showed. Dirk didn't get hasty though. He waited some more, and when the large group began making dinner outside, Dirk heard what he wanted. Ava, we've made dinner. Not interested. All right. Ava's father closed the door of a carriage after being grumbled at. Dirk felt his heart beat a little harder when he heard that voice. He walked around to that carriage. Looking at the wall, he saw a large window. It was closed, but Dirk didn't worry about that. Seeing as there weren't any sentries around and nobody within the window's line of sight, Dirk reached up. Using a bit of elemental sonar, Dirk found the lock of the window and used earth magic to move it. It clicked, and he quickly opened the window and slipped in. Who dash? SHH. Dirk immediately rushed at the young woman he saw, placing his hand over her mouth. She struggled, but when the two looked at each other, both froze. Dirk slowly removed his hand as Ava's eyes went wide. Although he couldn't see, he could make out Ava's figure from the earth and fire mana. She was taller, though a head shorter than him. This height was compensated for a bit by her antlers that had grown upward a bit and backward. It was forming into something like a crown, and she looked a bit majestic with it. Thankfully, it wasn't obnoxiously tall like her father's, only rising an inch or so above her head. Then, he could see her soft face. Her shapely curves. The long brown hair. And because his sense of smell was heightened due to the blindness, he could smell the natural aroma she emitted. It felt familiar despite so long having passed. I've never wanted my sight back more than now. Dirk cursed inwardly, stressing his dark mana vision to make out vague images of her. Still, even with the obscurity, his mother was correct. She was a very fine young woman. Dirk? Ava was also looking at him. Dirk had a cloth over his eyes, so she couldn't see the cursed cracks. But she could see his toned body underneath his casual clothes, along with the mature, sharp face. He looked so different yet familiar. Most of all, she couldn't mistake that aura. And the smell. Hi, Ava. You've changed. Why ya? Yeah. Dirk, what are you doing here? I should be asking that. I just got back, and you're trying to run away? I'm a little hurt. You. Ava was surprised at his tease, and she smiled when he did. You're such an ass. You were the one who was gone. I had to dungeon dive with Alec. Do you know how much slack I had to pull while you were gone? Are you telling me you couldn't complete jobs alone? I thought you had the skills. Ugh, shut up. When you were gone I... I wanted to get stronger. I was worried that when you came back, I wouldn't be able to beat you. I wanted to get stronger than that woman who took you. 
I thought maybe I could go and hunt you down then. Ava spoke through the tears that dripped down her cheeks, constantly wiping them away. Dirk went and hugged her, stroking her back in comfort. It's good to see you too, Ava. Hey, I'll have you know that I haven't cried in two months. You tell your mother that so she can stop calling me a crybaby. You're crying right now. It was still a new record. Ugh. I'm fine now. The two separated as Ava straightened her hair out. She then looked at him with a side eye before sitting on a nearby couch. So you want to tell me what your family is migrating for? Dirk sat down beside her. At first the two were separate, but after he smiled and waved, Ava laid against his chest. My father wants to escape the upcoming war. So I've surmised. But that doesn't seem like enough. There hasn't actually been an official declaration. So what's really going on? Ava was silent, struggling with something internally. She clenched his shirt a bit. He wants to escape the wartime law that may be imposed if a war does break out. The Empire can't have businesses, the backbone of its economy, doing as they please during a war. There will be more restrictions and investigations into suspicious activity. Okay? Does that mean? My father runs an illegal slave trading business within the Empire. Ava directly spoke, causing Dirk to shut his mouth. She curled up a bit, moving closer to him as if scared. A lot of the wagons in this caravan are filled with these slaves. And he can't abandon the business, so he's moving to where it isn't illegal. Where is that? The hybrid empire unity, a place dominated by hybrid races of all kinds. It's supposed to be some kind of prosperous utopia for the strong. My father has family there, so he'll be welcomed. Him and his merchandise. Ava growled a bit. Dirk suddenly remembered a map in his mind. The Dark Kingdom directly to the west. The Horizon Empire above it to the northwest. The Dwarven Haven directly north to the right of the Horizon Empire. And then there was Unity, occupying the east of the continent next to the dwarves. They were basically on the opposite side of the world from the Horizon Empire, separated by the Dwarven Haven. And this was the problem. If she were there, then Dirk wouldn't see her again for a long time. Why? Dirk asked after some silence, causing Ava to bite her lip. I know your father wants to leave, but why do you have to go? He said there's an opportunity there. Hybrids have special inherent abilities and have something called bloodlines. These bloodlines can be awakened when one hits a certain level of power. He wants me to do so when I reach that level of power. Is that it? You can get as strong as you want even without some bloodline. So why? You could stay with us. You have friends here. So why? I. They're my family. Ava sat up suddenly, startling Dirk. It's my mom and dad. My dad's a heinous bastard in the Empire, but he's just a businessman in Unity. I don't like what he does, but at least he doesn't have to hide so much there. And my mom had been there for me all my life. I can't. I've never been without them. I can't just leave. Both of them want me with them, and... Unity is supposed to be my home anyway. We're out of place in the Horizon Empire, even though it still has a lot of hybrids. I just can't dash. I understand. Dirk interrupted, grabbing her hand. If he understood anything, it was the love for one's parents. Dirk wouldn't be able to separate from his parents in such a situation. So he wouldn't ask her to. It's alright. You deserve to be with your parents. They'll be there to support you, and as you said, you can awaken your bloodline at Unity. It's not a bad thing, to go there. I'm sorry. Ava whispered as she touched her forehead to his. Her heart ached. Just as you came back. That doesn't matter. I'm just glad I got to see you one more time. He stroked her cheek, brushing her hair behind her ear. As if she were possessed, Ava suddenly pushed forward. She used a shocking amount of strength as she pulled their bodies together, planting her lips on his. She only got a few moments. Outside the wagon, fire crackled. Along with the explosion of an ember, 
Dirk seemed to see that whip coming down upon him. Crack! Ack! Dirk's body violently flinched, startling Ava as she pulled away. Sorry. Did I hurt you? No. I'm fine. Dirk shook his head a bit as he felt his back turn moist. Using elemental sonar, he saw the small bonfire that was set up outside. Ava turned a bit meek, thinking it was her fault. Sorry. I know you don't like that but… No. It's fine. He interrupted her. He remembered the last time this happened, feeling even worse than before. He tried to give an explanation. I just can't say we're old enough to be doing that stuff. We have to be adults. Are you asking me to wait for you? She looked into his eyes, surprising him a bit. You've gotten more direct, but yes, I guess you could say that. Mm, all right. Either way, I don't think we'd have a choice. Her voice drifted with a bit of sorrow. Then, she shook her head. She turned her attention to the strip of cloth over his eyes, seeking another topic of discussion. She reached for it. What is this, anyway? Are you doing some kind of training? Um. Dirk was a bit hesitant, but didn't back away as Ava lifted the cloth. She felt her heart drop when she saw the cursed crack sealing his eyes. What? I was cursed. It only blinds me, so I'm not being constantly hurt by it. You're blind? Those bastards, blinded you? Ava shivered a bit in rage. Blinding someone effectively disabled them. A blind man couldn't fight and couldn't live out a normal life. Vision was absolutely one of the most important tools to every being in the world. And losing it meant so much more than just not seeing anything. Ava couldn't believe that Dirk was actually blind. It's not as bad as you think. I was able to learn how to see through mana. Although it's not as nice as vision and I can't sense much beyond a certain range, it was able to keep me alive. I can see a lot of details, like the shape of your little nose and the strands of your hair. Although there's no color to anything, it's good enough. Good enough? Don't, don't say that. She clenched his shirt. She remembered that woman who took Dirk and felt blinding hatred. Hey! Dirk stroked her cheek, raising her head. Don't worry. Those people are going to pay. I'm going to bring them to their knees, and they'll hand over their lives. And when I'm strong enough, I'll be able to see properly again. Even before that time comes, I'll have created my own magic to let me see. The next time I see you, it'll be more than just an image. She nodded through half-gritted teeth, barely able to accept what happened. He smiled the next moment. And hey, I'm not any weaker. I'm actually quite a bit stronger. I think I can still beat you. These words seemed to perk Ava's competitive spirit. Washing away her hatred, she lifted her head with a smirk. Beat me? I'm almost tier 5, thank you very much. I'm also in the middle of rank 4. What about you? Still at the low end of tier 3. And I just got to rank 4. So it would be an even match then. Ugh, that's some arrogance. If you weren't so hot I'd say it doesn't suit you. Still, looks won't work on me, pretty boy. Ava pushed closer with a snarky grin, causing Dirk to chuckle. Hoo-hoo, well, I do have a trump card. I'm not sure you could handle it. What is it? Another layer of abs? Even better. It's a cat. Huh. Ava jerked back a bit as a tail suddenly brushed past her face. There was a cat beside them, and she looked at its large golden eyes. Cat? You know what a stigma is? This is mine. Oh. It's cute. The people who died while looking at me would think otherwise. And it talks? Ava was surprised as she heard a voice. Spite laid down next to them, getting comfortable. Don't mind me. Cats spend their entire lives sleeping, right? I guess I'll start now. Spite lowered her head as she said that, curling into a small ball. Ava gasped a bit at the cuteness. After that, Dirk and Ava spent a bit more time together. 
Since everyone was eating, and Ava had shown herself to be in a bad mood, nobody disturbed the wagon for a while. This gave them some much appreciated space. And for that short amount of time, they talked and cuddled their hearts out. They ignored what they knew would come. They focused on the moment. And then, there was a knock. Ava, sweetie? Are you sure you don't want a bite? Dinner will be over soon. It was Ava's mother. The two who had been laying on each other quickly got up. Ava bit her lip. I'll be out in a minute. All right. We have a plate for you. With that, the mother walked away. Ava's head hung as she felt her chest tighten. We're going to see each other again. Dirk eventually spoke. It was a vow and a promise. Ava nodded, lifting her head and clearing away bad thoughts. Yes, we will. I'm gonna get stronger. You're not gonna catch up to me. We'll see. And, maybe I should be the one to visit in the future. I haven't seen any other empires besides Horizon. I'd like to travel. How long? I mean, until you think about it. She got excited before stifling it in expectation. Dirk rubbed his chin with a cheeky grin. I think I'll give it a while. If I don't give you enough time to advance, I'll be too powerful for you to handle. Ugh, you're such a jerk. She snarled a bit before leaning forward. Dirk responded, and the two enjoyed one long moment in each other's arms. They separated when there was another knock on the door. Leaving a peck on her forehead, the most he was willing to do, Dirk turned and climbed back through the window. He hung a bit on its ledge, the two looking at each other through it. See you. He smiled before dropping, disappearing from view. Ava shook her head as she sniffled a bit. That's so not funny. Chapter 102, Usurp Dirk returned while the capital city was shrouded by night. He wasn't in the best mood, but he decided to be satisfied with seeing Ava once before she left. Upon arriving, he rode his horse back into the stable. Cecilia was there waiting for him. She saw that he didn't look happy, but it was good that he wasn't that angry either. I'm sorry, honey. It's fine. She wants her family. I'm not going to insist otherwise. Hmm. It's not easy, but there's always the future. Cecilia rubbed his back as she spoke lovingly. When her hand touched his exposed neck though, she stopped. What happened? She asked worriedly as she looked at her fingers. There was a hint of blood on them. Dirk hesitated a bit before taking off his shirt. Cecilia looked at his back which had the remnant scarring of whipping. There were over fifty different discolored lacerations that marred his skin. But, you healed. The caravan made a bonfire. Dirk turned, bundling up his shirt. An ember exploded. I heard the whip. When I left, I found blood on my back. The wounds, just appeared. Phantom scars. Cecilia spoke with mean eyes. It's pain that you feel when something triggers a, trauma. But it should be nothing more than pain. Because you remember the trauma so vividly and the pain feels real, your body effectively recreates the event. It's not voluntary. But why? I'm not afraid of some lousy piece of string. You underestimate what actually happened to you, my child. Cecilia walked around Dirk, tracing the scars on his back with gritted teeth. The whip they used. It destroys your mind. At some point, your body becomes able to handle any pain you throw at it. But, the mind is greater than the body. It can handle more. It has more capacity for pain. Those whips, starting at seven, no longer harm just your body but your mind. The level 10 whip is capable of destroying a person's mind, killing them while only wounding their body. It's an advanced curse magic. Dirk, your scars run deeper than your flesh. I'm just glad that you were able to survive what you did. She hugged him from behind, disregarding the dried blood on his skin. Dirk scowled inwardly. I've been traumatized by that man? Ridiculous. He refused to believe it. He had fought through everything, tooth and nail. Though, he was also beginning to see that there really was more to Azure's torture than he knew. 
first the potion withdrawals, and now the mental scarring. What more did that snake do to him? It pissed him off that something had slipped through his defenses. Oh well. Dirk eventually sighed. He didn't like worrying his mother, so he quickly moved on. The advent of the Dark Dragon, an annual holiday of the Dark Kingdom, was around a month away from the time Dirk made his recovery. Dirk had already talked with his mother about it. She and Riker would be going, so Dirk was going to join them. While Riker was going as an envoy of the Empire, Dirk and his mother would be going for the sake of getting out of the house. They had no responsibilities on this trip. But of course, they weren't totally uninvolved. As of now, the Dark Kingdom was hostile territory. Technically, for the duration of their stay, they would be political hostages. The armies at the border would be a bit on edge as they waited for this round of diplomacy to bear fruit. If anything big and bad happened, war could immediately break out. Of course, these political hostages were anything but helpless. Dirk and his mother were expert assassins even though Dirk didn't have the same sheer power. Riker was also a renowned battle mage, though Dirk had never actually seen his full power. Not only that, there would be a duke going with them, one of the few tier 8s of the Empire. The combat strength of the envoys surpassed that of the armies on the border. From what Dirk surmised, a tier 8 was nothing short of a tactical nuke, while tier 7s like his father could control entire battlefields. Long story short, even the weak Dirk would be perfectly safe so long as he wasn't isolated. Of course, Dirk wasn't planning on being weak for long. He hadn't been able to advance in power much at Azura's Mountain. But now that he had resources at his disposal and an accumulated elemental comprehension, he planned to make a jump. His first order of business was his fire and lightning mana heart. Like his earth and metal mana heart, he had to create the mana heart with equal amounts of both types of mana. This wasn't difficult at all, and after getting set up in a high-quality room at the Magic Pyramid, he had all the dense mana he wanted. And his growth truly was explosive. In a mere week, Dirk was able to push his fire and lightning mana heart near completion. After creating the rune for the heart and enchanting it, he smoothly triggered the advancement. It was a repeat of what happened with his earth mana heart. His awareness was pulled into the mana dimension, and he watched as his soul opened itself up. His mana heart that was half fire and half lightning sunk into the soul, filling the void. And now that he made proper preparations, Cecilia was on standby, and she crushed fire and lighting mana crystals to give Dirk plenty of fuel. It was a perfect advancement when the cavity in Dirk's soul was completely filled with mana. After a short amount of time, the fire mana heart appeared next to his earth mana heart. Both of them contracted with the beats of his physical heart, pumping dense amounts of every mana type into his blood. For a while, it made sparks and arcs jump around his skin until things settled down. Even Dirk's breath let out some flame, causing his mother to chuckle. Congratulations. Thanks. Dirk smiled. Only, this was just a small advancement. It would greatly increase his ability to wield fire and lightning mana, but his tier was still tier 3 dash. Getting to this point, Dirk frowned. To get to tier 3 mid, he would need to create his dark mana heart. The only problem was the annoying bug in his way. Eldritch Primordial Dirk recalled those abyssal eyes within the mana dimension. Dirk had actually glanced at him while creating the fire mana heart. That dark being was always there, always watching him. And due to his godly powers, Dirk was unable to control any dark mana. Well, that's not completely true. Dirk did have access to a small reservoir of dark mana. This was due to the darkness that he wrested away from Eldritch Primordial. The small amount of darkness he took gave him access to that amount of mana. So there was only one way to continue advancing. It's time to pay him a visit. Dirk thought with a smile. He looked at his mother who was still with him in the manor room. She was excited about his advancement, but he decided to ride this wave of success. Give me a moment, mom. Saying that, Dirk closed his eyes. He concentrated, and he looked to the door to the manor dimension. Normally it was sealed tight, but due to the advancement, it was still open. Dirk pushed through, and his awareness returned to his soul. 
Dirk smiled as he saw the ocean of mana around him. Then, he looked down at those dark eyes. How's it going, Eldritch? Remember that full course meal I promised to take? You dare step into death's domain? The dark being below screeched a bit in rage. Then, a small cluster of dark mana was shot at Dirk. Begone. Dirk watched as the cluster threatened to injure his soul. Unlike before though, he wasn't helpless. Cat. My name is Spite. Spite spoke as she appeared next to Dirk's soul. Shooting forward, she swam through the ocean of mana and intercepted the cluster. With a flick of the head, she snatched the dark cluster out of the air, swallowing it whole. At that moment, Dirk felt a bit more dark mana be made available to him. A simple game. Dirk nodded in agreement when Spite snickered. It was a battle for territory. Eldritch Primordial controlled all dark mana. So if Dirk wanted some, he just had to take it. Dirk had to trespass into the domain of chaos. Eldritch Primordial also knew this. But it wasn't angry. In fact, Dirk could sense a bit of glee. Come then. Dirk heard that grating voice, and tendrils rose up from the darkness. They stopped at a certain level, as if hitting a barrier. This was its domain. Dirk lowered himself into that domain. Hand your soul to me. With a clash of chaos and an ordered soul, a fierce battle of the elements ensued. Ugh. Dirk? Cecilia was suddenly startled when Dirk collapsed. From his mouth, eyes, and nose poured blood. His body shivered uncontrollably. But he was smiling. Before Cecilia could bend down to hold him, she suddenly felt dark mana surge toward his body. An advancement. She was startled before reflexively pulling out a dark mana crystal and breaking it, making the environment dense with dark mana. She then bent down and laid Dirk's body against hers. After a minute or so, his body calmed down, as did the surrounding mana. Cecilia watched as Dirk's complexion quickly healed. I. I did it. Dirk chuckled before his head went limp. Cecilia was worriedly confused as he fell asleep. At the same time, in the mana dimension, Eldritch Primordial was livid. Dirk had taken a lot of ground for himself. It was a grand battle between Dirk and Dark Mana taking all kinds of shapes and forms. Dirk not only had to defend, but usurp the Dark Mana for himself. It took a ton of energy to do this, and compared to the vastness of what Eldritch Primordial controlled, his effects were minuscule. But nonetheless, Dirk had carved out a domain of his own. At first it had been nothing. But now, if Dirk had to measure it in terms of depth within the ocean of mana, it was around 150 meters deep. It was at that point that Dirk had to stop because the resistance grew exponentially. He had pushed so far and felt like he got closer to Eldritch Primordial, nonetheless. While those abyssal eyes were still far away, they were definitely closer than before. Dirk could feel the presence of that dark being flow around him. 1,000 meters. Spite suddenly spoke. She was also drained, but for her, it was only a matter of energy levels. Dirk's soul stood on the border of his domain. Is that how far you are? Dirk's eyes bored into Eldritch. He's 1,000 meters deep. Proportionally, you should be able to take 100 meters per tier. I'm lacking then. And tier 10 doesn't exist unless a tier 10 would be in existence like Eldritch. Probably. Only way to find out would be to get there yourself. Baby steps. Says the one who just performed a magical blitzkrieg on a god. Spite snickered, its whiskers twitching in excitement. After the battle, Dirk calmed himself. Fighting Eldritch wasn't like fighting a normal enemy. He had to combat all those dark tendrils and bullets and curses with his own power to wield elements. Dirk controlled earth, fire, metal, lighting, and dark mana as he moved forward. Thankfully, due to the recent small advancement he was able to squeeze out more energy than normal. It's curious though. He's so powerful and yet he can actually be pushed back. It's like he's being limited. I agree but I doubt he's in any mood to satisfy our curiosity. 
Dirk looked into Eldritch's deep eyes. He had refused to speak when Dirk kicked him back. Perhaps there were sinister machinations brewing behind his vast mind. Either way, they weren't getting anything out of him. Anyway, time for me to get some sleep. Dirk immediately passed out when he said that. His physical body sleeping and his consciousness were two different things. He had kept himself awake, but he was utterly exhausted. After ensuring that things were safe, he finally let go. Fighting Eldritch Primordial for his domain was, in a way, a form of cultivating mana. It was much different than gradually increasing the density of his mana heart. Dirk's other elements didn't have anything like domains to invade and take. So Dirk needed to gather it himself and accumulate normally. But when he encroached on Eldritch Primordial's domain, the dark mana he took was immediately handed to him. There was no need to accumulate. The dark mana was now in absolute control of his soul to do whatever he wanted with. This was his domain. So when Dirk had taken a large enough domain, he realized that he was immediately able to create his dark mana heart. Like that, he simply pulled on the mana within his domain, instantly forming the mana heart and triggering his advancement. And now, Dirk had all three of his mana hearts. Of course, there were pros and cons to doing things this way. Dirk still couldn't control any dark mana outside of his domain. This basically meant that Dirk had a fixed pool. For Dirk's other elements, while he had a certain amount of mana in his mana pools, he could constantly regenerate his pool with mana lungs, giving him magical longevity. But because he was fighting for his domain, he had an absolutely fixed dark mana pool. When he used it up, he could cast no more dark magic. This is when Dirk found something peculiar. His domain allowed him access to a certain amount of mana. But when he spent it, it gradually came back like regenerating energy. It wasn't like his other mana pools that naturally drew from the surroundings to recover mana. Dirk couldn't control the surrounding dark mana. So where was this mana regeneration from? Dirk wasn't sure, but whatever this source was, his domain controlled it. Thus, he had access to this regenerating source of dark mana. Dirk was happy. Of course, this didn't all come for free. He was pretty sure his soul was injured in the process. He woke up after a day of rest, and when he did, he felt a constant pain in his chest. It wasn't heartache, but pain coming from his soul. And even after several hours, it never went away. It always remained, just a dull ache that annoyed him. Of course, Dirk had a hardened mind, so he could bear it. Still, when three days passed and the pain never left, he began to think that this was permanent. That was when he went to his mother. She had been worried about him after his advancement, but he assured her it was nothing. She thought it was backlash from forcing his dark man heart to form. After he promised to never force advancements and showed that he was magically fine, she was satisfied. But now he had a question for her. Can a soul be hurt? Dirk asked as Cecilia cooked some food. She stopped when she heard him and looked back at him with worry. He shook his head. My soul is fine. Good. Because any harm that comes to your soul is devastating. It inhibits your ability to regenerate mental energy, causes eternal pain, and can impair your ability to control the elements. Well that isn't good. Spite mumbled in Dirk's head. Dirk had lied when he said his soul was fine. It really was injured. So learning this wasn't good news. Is the soul being injured really that bad? Of course. The soul is the deepest essence of every being. It's the foundation for their existence. People with injured souls can be driven to madness and have their minds collapse from the eternal pain, and the lucky ones merely lose their ability to control the elements. Thankfully there aren't many ways a soul can be injured in the first place. But that also means there aren't many ways to heal a soul. I've only heard a few legends of items that can heal or nurture a soul. Oh. Dirk frowned. He didn't think it would be so bad. But it seemed like his injuries were the mildest of mild. Dirk remembered that Eldritch still wanted Dirk's soul, so he couldn't destroy it. At least, the injury he caused Dirk wasn't irreversible. 
Dirk could also see that it barely affected him at all, merely giving him a dull eternal pain. So he snickered a bit. He can't stop me. He wants me alive and can't kill me while I encroach on his territory. Still, there must be something he can do to take my soul. I can't push my lock. He's likely just as devious as Azura. Baby steps. He nodded as he made his plans. As he got more powerful, he would gradually take more territory. He would stick to the safe route, making stable progress and not making himself vulnerable to surprises. Chapter 103 Apprentice Slash Destruction it was three weeks until the advent of the Dark Dragon. After creating his mana hearts of fire and dark, Dirk spent some time furthering his comprehension of all the runes he'd traced from the original magic texts. With an abundant supply of all his elements, Dirk was able to properly practice spells. He practiced void walking, a spell he used very often in the jungle of death. He pushed himself to understand the complex runes he traced in the Void Walking book even though it was supposed to be beyond his level. And surprisingly, he was able to comprehend a lot more. The same went for all the other texts. He was able to learn a lot of magical theory about lightning as well as a few powerful spells from the series of Lightning book. One was a lightning bolt spell that shocked and scorched enemies with lightning that came from your hands. The other was a spell that could enhance weapons with lightning effects, paralyzing enemies and incinerating their body when hit. Dirk didn't just learn spells from traced runes though. Because he also had his new stigma, he planned to use it correctly. So Dirk worked on creating his own magic. It actually didn't take long for Dirk to learn how to create metal bullets. His enhanced fireball spell was also highly condensed, so after a bit of alteration, Dirk was able to make the projectile speed of the fireball much faster. The same went for the metal bullet where Dirk sacrificed a bit of material strength for much higher speeds. Then Dirk looked toward dark mana. He already knew how to create little clusters of dark mana, so he created a spell that made it into a bullet. Then, Dirk actually learned the runic texts behind Curse of Darkness. Curse of Darkness was a spell one could learn at Tier 3 so Dirk didn't have much trouble learning at all. This was especially so since he recently took over a domain of dark mana. He was able to gain great comprehensions of the element, allowing him to understand the runes much easier. So Dirk applied curses to his bullets. The curses were corrosive ones that would eat away at an opponent's vitality over time, destroying their bodies. With this type of bullet, he could fire a few and then gradually cut his opponent down. It was great for long-term battles. Though, Dirk didn't intend to invest much power into it. Void walking was a more useful application of his limited dark mana. After that, Dirk had three types of bullets, metal, fire, and dark. He tried to make a lightning bullet, but that proved to be extremely difficult. Lightning was too volatile and had little discernible form. Other than that, Dirk focused on one other spell he had in his arsenal. He didn't use it much since its power was limited, but now he intended to fix that. Earthguard was a spell that could create armor out of dirt or rock, guarding a single limb or area of the body. Dirk went ahead and modified it, making the armor metal. While metal mana obeyed slightly different rules than standard earth mana, it was still relatively easy to modify the spell. It wasn't long before Dirk was able to generate metal plating over parts of his body. They were solid and powerful, only lesser than properly forged armor. With that, Dirk had the spells he wanted. He then focused on his techniques. Stealth was used to hide. Dirk had made this technique after combining fairy, elemental manipulation, and silent spells. It was a complex technique to activate, but worked relatively well when he wasn't up against the jungle of death. It could get past the senses of people at and around his power level but it wasn't perfect. So Dirk decided to bring the technique to his mother so she could help him refine it. She proved to be a shockingly great help, and he was able to sharpen some things up and make it much easier to use. Then there was elemental sonar and Dirk's mana vision. His mana vision was a work in progress, at least, his dark mana vision was. But even that improved greatly after his recent domain takeover in the mana dimension. 
Dirk was able to form reliable black and white images. For once, he could properly make out faces. He could also see much farther with this black and white vision since it was based on light and brightness, not his general mana sense. As for elemental sonar, Dirk only refined the efficiency and applied some stealth concepts to it, making it more discreet. He was happy with the end result. With that, Dirk had sharpened up all of his magical tools. Next, he took a look at his aura. Aura was an emission of anima beyond the body. Dirk only learned to eject it, creating a small outward wave of pure destruction. It wasn't focused in any way and was crude in its usage, so it was only good to supplement punches or kicks. Dirk had used it a few times in the jungle, though he had been more focused on using anima to run and escape. Dirk went to his mother for guidance for this as well, and she was surprised that he was able to create aura at all. He told her that it came naturally with his anima technique after he finished blood destruction, surprising her yet again. Afterward, she showed him the more advanced levels. A pawn class warrior could activate anima in their bodies, strengthening themselves actively. A knight class warrior could emit anima in the form of aura, though only in a crude form like Dirk. A rook-class warrior could sharpen and concentrate their aura, using it to enhance their weapons and launch blades of absolute sharpness. Then, there was the bishop class. Dirk was told that bishops could wield their aura in ways that gave rise to magical phenomena. And amazingly, his mother showed him exactly what that meant. Cecilia first showed what an aura blade looked like. A rook was someone who could channel their aura into a weapon without destroying it instead using the weapon to guide and supplement their aura when destroying something. She told him that a skilled rank 6 or a genius rank 5 warrior could become a rook class. She picked up a kitchen knife, and with a flick, released a void black blade into the air. It dissipated quickly since she hardly infused any power into it. Still, it caught through the air, sending a shiver down Dirk's spine. He couldn't imagine how sharp that blade was. But then, she showed him something amazing. She suddenly started waving the knife around. The tip of the knife drew thin lines in the air that disappeared after a short second. After a few seconds of this, she stopped and reached out her finger. Her finger touched something in the air. It was one of the threads, and it had turned invisible. After flicking the thread though, Dirk saw hundreds of lines of threads momentarily appear all around the room they were in. She had filled the place with a web of death. Dirk froze up, not moving an inch as he felt goosebumps on his neck. Bishop class. Dirk was amazed at this power. Cecilia didn't look like much when she fought Azura since he had absolutely suppressed her, but he was beginning to understand that she was most definitely a monstrous woman. He believed that Azura was her only rival, along with others of his insane level. She could beat anyone else. Go ahead and walk around. Cecilia suddenly spoke to him after he froze up. Gulping in nervousness, he nodded and took a step forward. He felt nothing as he walked through the path of dozens of those strings. It looked like they had disappeared. But they hadn't. Cecilia flicked the string again, and he saw them all reappear. Dirk had walked right through them, and he didn't sense a thing. Yeah, she's a master assassin. Dirk couldn't help but smile a bit. His mother was outrageously powerful. It made him happy. After that, Cecilia started to train Dirk on sharpening his aura. He was a rank 4 dash, and she promised that she could make him a rook by rank 5. He smiled at her conviction, and they began a short daily routine of training. Training his magic and body wasn't all Dirk wanted to do though. He remembered a certain someone who had apparently been worried about him. Dirk! You dare disappear while in the middle of lessons? I was teaching you the good stuff. Do you know how much you have to catch up on? You were supposed to be forging with mana crystals long ago. It's nice to see you, Sir Tobaston. Dirk chuckled when he appeared at Forge 8. The dwarf immediately started yelling, but Dirk didn't mind. Tobaston yelled all the time. It was just how he communicated. Seeing Dirk laugh, Tobaston grabbed him by the collar and dragged him inside the forge. We're doing twelve hours today. I hope you haven't been jerking off for the past two and a half years. 
at least you look a little bigger than before. That means you can hammer more metal. Ha, yeah, understood. He laughed as Tobastin threw him his hammer. Dirk was a bit nostalgic before he caught a thrown ingot. And he quickly got to work, Tobastin grilling him with tons of advanced knowledge. He did a short recap on everything they had learned before Dirk disappeared. Then they moved on to the hard stuff. Elemental manipulation, precise metal shaping, infusing elemental power. Tobastin introduced concepts and techniques that Dirk hadn't heard of before, and he was forced to exert lots of energy as he refined his physical and magical control. But Dirk was able to pick up on things shockingly fast. Tobastin was pleasantly surprised. And it wasn't uncalled for. Although Dirk had been through hell, he hadn't been idle. His strength and endurance increased, and his magical prowess jumped significantly just recently. Along with Dirk's natural growth, his overall skill went up. Dirk's muscle memory quickly came back as he moved his body with precision. Of course, there was only so much Tobastin could properly teach in a day, so Dirk wasn't given everything to learn at once. But compared to the past, it was a big leap. By the end of the day, Dirk was breathing fire with every swing of the hammer. Lightning also crackled around his skin. His body was bursting with elemental energy due to his mana hearts, and Tobastin had cheered when he saw Dirk controlling flame like a dragon. Before they knew it, twelve hours passed. Dirk stood straight. His mind was a bit tired from wielding the elements, but his body was bursting with energy. It had vast endurance thanks to his blood destruction and his restoration skill. All right, now go home and digest everything you learned. I expect you back here in the morning. And don't go disappearing again. Don't worry, I won't. And, thanks for continuing to teach me, Sir Tobastin. Sorry for being gone for so long. Please, you think two years is long? I've lived for close to three hundred years. I have no problem waiting a couple more for my genius apprentice to return. Of course. Dirk was stunned by his words for a bit before smiling. So I'm his apprentice now, huh? Dirk bid goodbye as he thought about that. Tobastin had never directly called him his apprentice before. It had always been an unspoken thing between them. He was happy. Magical study, aura practice, and forging. These three things comprised Dirk's schedule. Dirk woke up early to work with his mother and went to Forge 8 for forging lessons. At the end of the day, he would study more traced runes and practice more magic, ending with a tired mind. But there was one more thing Dirk needed to work on. He had completed Section 2 of his Anima Resonance Destruction Technique, Blood Destruction. Now came Section 3. Section 3 required one to resonate and destroy the muscles with Anima. It was as straightforward as the other two sections. This technique really was all about destroying the body and refining it making it stronger. But there was one other detail Dirk learned through the runes in the book. With every step forward, the anima in the body became denser and denser. Likewise, it became more difficult to destroy parts of the body down the line. It required not just more anima, but denser anima. So the book called for different items that could be used in the process of resonation and destruction. The items varied greatly, but they could all be summarized. Anything from a living thing that accumulated anima could be used as a source of anima. The bones of monsters, the cores of special trees, exotic fruits, even rare synthetic formations like metal or veins or special rocks. There were all kinds of things that utilized or accumulated anima in this world. In fact, things that accumulated anima were just as prevalent as things that accumulated mana. This could be seen in the amount of mages versus the amount of warriors. Many more people could train anima and not mana. It was also easier to train anima, though only for the low ranks. So finding monsters or other life forms with dense amounts of anima wasn't that difficult. And the book showed Dirk a simple technique to channel anima from other sources and into the body to destroy what he wished. It merely required him to touch the source and absorb it through the porous membrane that was his skin. Skin destruction had precisely prepared him for this. Long story short, Dirk needed dense sources of anima to use. 
he wouldn't be able to progress anymore without it. His blood destruction had taken a long time since he had been using ambient anima, in fact. It would have gone faster if he had dense anima sources. Luckily, Dirk had rich parents. Upon telling his mother about the next steps he needed to take, she immediately tossed him a bone. A literal bone. It was a human skull, in fact. Dirk was a bit surprised when he caught it. His mother got a bit sheepish. Sorry sweetie, it's the only source of anima I have on me. I'll grab some for you later. Until then, that will act as a great source for anima. It came from a high rank 5. Oh. Thanks. Dirk didn't mind that much. The next moment though, his mother tossed him another object. Since you lost your other one. Dirk caught a small ring out of the air. It was a pocket ring, and when he checked it, he was surprised to see a 100 cubic meter space. It was an absolutely massive space compared to the previous one he had. Dirk smiled. Thanks mom. It's nothing. I would get you an even larger one, but it's not necessary for you right now. Powerful rings can also attract unnecessary attention. Of course. Whatever the explanation, Dirk was happy with it. He slipped it over his index finger where it was most snug, then put the anima skull into it. Since Dirk lived in his parents' house now, there was no need to go home. That night, he pulled out the skull and got comfortable as he recalled the technique to channel anima from a source. He also did a bit of pondering. I should prioritize the muscles I destroy. Start with the important ones. But which one? Dirk went through all the sections of his body. His legs, arms, abdomen, back, neck, and feet. He wondered which one he wanted to become stronger first. I'm already strong everywhere, so there's nothing that's lacking. In that case, it should be something that would give me an edge when fighting. If I assume the worst opponent, then I should prioritize speed over sheer power. So legs will be first. But. I can't immediately strengthen the biggest muscles. I should reinforce the flexors and mobility muscles. In that case, let's start with my hips. Then I can do my knees. And then my calves and ankles. Then I can do the quads and glutes and hamstrings. Then I'll need to do my core for stability. Yes, let's start with that. Dirk quickly made an ordered list. And with the decision made, he started with his right leg. He targeted the right hip flexors, the muscles that allowed the leg to raise and gave it some horizontal mobility. Dirk didn't want to target the largest muscles and then create strength imbalances or even harm himself. He prioritized stable and gradual strengthening, not sudden and erratic. Of course, his strengthening wouldn't happen immediately. It would be a long process to destroy every muscle group in his body. Or will it? Dirk suddenly questioned that. He had his new restoration skill that repaired his body. With it, he could heal faster and destroy things faster. Just destroy the muscle already and then we'll know. All right then. Dirk shrugged after hearing spite before channeling anima out of the skull. He placed it against his leg and absorbed it through the skin. Then, he concentrated it before resonating it. Dirk felt as his muscles were destroyed by the cell. It was like the anima was burning his muscle alive. The pain was much greater than blood destruction. But Dirk didn't so much as frown. He was merely curious as he felt the muscles weaken greatly. He also noticed how much of the anima he resonated dissipated during the process. Dirk wasn't sure if this was due to a lack of skill or if it was natural. Either way, when he hit a certain level of destruction, he stopped. Standing up, Dirk could barely lift his knee with weakness. So my muscle isn't totally immobilized, just really weak. That's good to know. How's the healing? Give me a minute. Spite mumbled as she observed his body. The nanites flooded to the muscle, and his skill kicked in. Cells began to naturally regenerate and rebuild the muscle with surprising speed. His mana also vitalized the destroyed muscle giving it more strength despite nearly half of it being obliterated. Dirk felt all the food he ate from dinner be burned for fuel. 
his heart pumped nutrients through his bloodstream, his nanites following along to increase the throughput of essential supplies. He decided to grab more food as his fuel was burned. After cooking himself a large slab of meat, he ate as the muscle continued to rebuild. It was almost half an hour later when Spike came back with a report. The muscle should be completely rebuilt and fully functional in 14 hours. Really? That's nice. Question is though, how much progress does each destruction cycle give me? Dirk asked the most important question. He might heal fast, but if the muscles didn't regenerate with a lot of anima, it would take a lot of destruction cycles to complete a single muscle. We can only wait and see. True. Then let's hurry up and sleep. Dirk spoke before finishing up his midnight dinner and going to bed. He slept with a bit of excitement that night. Chapter 104 Airship Slash Dark Kingdom One week until the advent of the Dark Dragon. For the past two weeks, Dirk stuck to his schedule, and his skills improved in every way. He grew into the accumulated elemental comprehensions, bringing his power to another level. His main focus though was on his muscle destruction. After two weeks, Dirk was able to completely destroy and refine his hip flexor. But he was not happy about that time frame. Too long. A single muscle took two weeks. I destroyed it every day. Two solutions. Spite chimed in as he frowned. You can either increase the amount of muscle you destroy every cycle, or you can destroy the muscle more thoroughly. You only destroyed about half of it each cycle. You could destroy up to 75% and be safe. There's a downside though. You wouldn't be able to use the muscle at all while it heals. 15 hours of healing may not be a lot, but in enemy territory, you need to keep your weakness to a minimum. I suggest the first option. I agree. Dirk nodded after giving it some thought. He wouldn't like not being able to use his muscles at all after destroying them. Depending on the muscle, he would have a hard time just going about daily life. At least if he did things normally he would retain some function, however weak. So let's destroy more at a time. You can do it by muscle groups. I've categorized 13 that cover all sections of the body from your chest to your calves. If each group takes two weeks to fully destroy and refine, then that would be 26 weeks of daily destructions, or half a year. What if I tried to destroy them all? Instead of going by muscle groups, I could do full body destruction cycles. In theory, it would only take two weeks to complete muscle destruction. That would be hard for your restoration skill to handle. Recovery would take much longer. You would also need an ample anima supply. And then there's the issue of properly refining the muscles. There might not be enough anima to go around if everything is recovering, leading to lesser results upon healing. So in actual theory, it would likely take much longer than two weeks, and you would remain in a bed for all hours of every day. Could I at least try? Ask your mother first. Fine. Giving in, Dirk went and found his mother. She was a powerful warrior, so she knew all about body refining. Absolutely not. And she didn't like Dirk's idea. You know there is such thing as anima overload, right? Just like you can strain yourself with mana accumulation, you can potentially permanently harm your body if you overdo the refining. Body refining is a gradual process that your body must adapt alongside, steadily bringing it to a higher level. It's not just a matter of shoving anima inside yourself and expecting to get stronger. That's how you cripple yourself for life. And no, your restoration skill wouldn't be able to heal from it. If you cripple yourself with anima, it's absolutely permanent unless healed by an extremely strong anima potion. Do you understand? Yes, mother. Good. Never attempt something like that. And thank you for coming to me first. Please do so when you have more crazy ideas like that. Spite, you'll be in charge of reminding him and alerting me. I understand. Mm, love you. Cecilia smiled and kissed Dirk on the forehead after the cat nodded from his shoulder. Dirk sighed inwardly. Well, six months it is then. That's already moving plenty fast. You'll be fine. Besides, I wouldn't wish to serve a crippled master. 
Did you just call me master? No. You did. Well, I guess you were my underling. Dirk scratched his chin with a smile, stopping when Spite pawed his face. A I'm not. I'm a part of you. We're equals. You were created from my soul. So I was birthed from you. Are you my father? Should I call you daddy? Please don't. Dirk's eye twitched. Spite seemed to enjoy his shame. Well, I guess you being my father is giving you too much credit. You do give me energy though, so you're like a sugar daddy. Stop. You're right. Just daddy is fine. What's the matter? Don't like it? You will become a tattoo before I hear any more of that. Fine. You're no fun. Spite finally huffed. She liked her cat form and its freedom. Not being able to explore and operate a body was boring. Thankful that he shut that down, Dirk moved on with his life. Three days until the advent of the Dark Dragon. Dirk had thought that his mother would bring him out to hunt any Azura assassins before this big outing, but since he had such a busy schedule with forging and all, she just let him be. It wasn't a bad thing to accumulate much needed power anyway. And before Dirk knew it, the time for the holiday came. It was at this time that Riker finally appeared. He had been gone with work all the time. Being an envoy, especially one at his level, wasn't an easy responsibility to handle. His voice was now that of the Empire's. We're going to leave for a frontier city tomorrow night. We'll take a teleporter there and then embark for the capital of the Dark Kingdom. We should arrive by midday the next day. After that, we hold some preliminary discussions and get ready for the holiday. We'll be participating in it alongside the royalty there. We need to bring dresses? No. It'll supposedly be prepared for us. I would bring at least one set just in case though. Of course. Cecilia nodded at her husband's words. Dirk just ate the dinner in front of him. He was hungry from all the healing his body was doing. Seeing this, Cecilia was both happy and worried. Dirk had refused to drink so much as a drop of potion. She left it out for him, but it went untouched for the weeks that he was doing destruction cycles. She knew he could handle the healing just fine, but she wanted to ease the burden on his body. But she knew he was tough, so she didn't insist. She trusted in his judgment and didn't want to force him to do something that might bring back bad memories. After that night, Dirk spent one more day in the capital. He was a bit more relaxed as he just focused on forging. He also told Tobastin that he would be leaving. Because of that, the dwarf pushed him harder that day. Come night, Dirk cleaned up before he was called by his mother. Having already prepared, he went down with the clothes on his back and pocket ring filled with items. Before they left though, Cecilia grabbed his attention. Two things. She suddenly held up both her hands. In one was a necklace made of two black metal strands that were twisted together, holding a crystal pendant at the bottom. In the other was a weapon, a long knife that was almost a short sword. The necklace has defensive magic as well as an alert beacon. You can also use it to send me messages after infusing your dark mana and speaking into it. This knife is an enchanted weapon. It's designed to channel your aura. Technically you can only channel aura into weapons when you're a rook class, but enchanted animal weapons like this bypass the skill restriction and do it for you. In exchange, it's not compatible with mana. But you have your stigma, so that shouldn't be an issue. With this, you have your strengths boosted. Thank you, mother. Dirk nodded pleasantly as he took the knife. Cecilia also put the necklace on him. The cold metal warmed on his body. Let's go then. With that, the two left the house and made their way to the city's teleportation platform. There, Riker was waiting, along with a small group of people. There were three men and two women. Two of the men and both the women didn't have much power in them, being as strong as or weaker than Dirk. The third man though caused Dirk to narrow his eyes. He couldn't sense much of anything. He looked ordinary besides the luxurious clothes. But Dirk's hair stood on end. His gut was telling him to not believe the lack of power. The man also looked at Dirk after greeting Cecilia. 
he smiled, exposing two long and sharp fangs. So you're Dirk? I've heard a lot about you. You really do have sharp senses. Dirk, this is Marquis Desmodius. Riker suddenly introduced the man. Hearing the name, Dirk tilted his head. Desmodius. He's Alec's father. Dirk's eyebrows raised. He then smiled when he saw a figure approaching. Dirk! Dirk turned his body, sensing a man flowing with a magnificently bright presence. In Dirk's mana sense, he drove away darkness and purified his surroundings with divine light. It was Alec, a fire and light mage with sky-high charisma. Hello Alec. That's a bland greeting. I haven't seen you in years. Come here, guy. Alec put out his hand. Dirk smacked it with his own and went in for a hug. They pat each other on the back, a truly manly greeting. Dirk smiled. The two hadn't been super close, but it didn't seem like Alec cared. He was happy to see a friend. Sheesh, I had worked hard and formed a party that could keep up with you, and then you go and vanish. We're going on a trip now though, so maybe I can get a taste of your current power. Who knows, maybe I've become stronger than you. Heh, <sighs> we'll have to fight and see. Dirk chuckled as he looked at Alec. Like Dirk, he had grown a lot. He was actually an inch or so taller, his golden hair flowing down to his broad shoulders. His muscles were also a bit more pronounced, not as compact and lean as Dirk's, so he was definitely containing a lot of power. He looked like a grown man if one looked past the youthful face. And it looked like he was at least tier 4, if not tier 5 with how bright his mana was. Puberty hit everyone like a truck, huh? Dirk laughed, and the two talked a bit more. The others in the group lingered around for a while. Then, the teleportation platform suddenly glowed. A man appeared, bristling with an aura of sheathed violence. He looked mean and stern, gazing at everyone with narrowed eyes. Duke Kyer, known as the Bloody Sword of the Empire and the highest general under the Emperor. He's as ruthless as he is wise, and he holds vast authority. There weren't any others who held more power than him under the Emperor. He stood taller than all others in the group, being nearly seven feet tall. His black and red robes radiated in position as if demanding all others obey his every command. Still, his sharply cut beard and hair made him look valiant. To have this man stand beside you on a battlefield would inspire undying bravery. Are we all here? Then let's go. Duke Kyer activated the teleporter with a deep voice. With his word, everyone stepped forward. Within moments, they vanished. The next thing Dirk knew, he was inside a large stone building. Everyone walked out, and they appeared within a city. The frontier city of Brazer, a city similar to that of Calaba which occupied land along the border. Only, because the Empire was much less friendly with the Dark Kingdom than the Dwarven Haven, this city was fully outfitted for war at all times, maintaining a huge standing army. This was especially so right now. Citizens and soldiers alike were moving with haste. Two armies were in a stalemate not far from here, so they had to be on high alert. Duke Kyer led them through the city, and every soldier bowed in reverence as he passed. Dirk felt a bit weird. He was walking with really high-profile people. He could be considered one of them as the son of a Marquis. His status was showing its benefits. It wasn't long before the group approached a huge raised platform. Dirk almost tripped when he saw what was on the platform. There's the airship. Alec mumbled. Standing at 120 meters long and 20 meters tall, an airship glowed with enchantments, air mana, and even some dark mana. There were no sails or anything of the like, and the ship looked shockingly similar to a modern plane from Earth with wings and fins. It was only a bit larger and bulkier. Curiously, the body of the airship looked like it was made from some kind of crystalline material. The body was sky blue in color, seemingly constructed from opaque fragile glass. Alex spoke as the group boarded this ship, entering its large body. This ship is made almost entirely from aerolite. As an air element metal, aerolite is both strong and light, allowing the mana engine of this thing to lift such a large ship off the ground. It's also fully compatible with the air element, 
allowing it to fly through the sky at high speeds. Of course, it's an extremely expensive item, and there aren't a whole lot of these in the Empire. Dirk took in the sights around him. Since his dark mana vision had improved greatly, he could make out black and white images, albeit not perfectly. It still gave him a good look at the corridors, machines, and people they passed while walking through the ship. They quickly arrived at the bridge of the airship. There was already a man waiting, and he saluted Duke Kyer. Leave when ready. Understood, General. Commencing takeoff in five minutes. Dirk felt the man around him fluctuate. Although he wasn't attuned to air mana, he could still sense its wild movement. Then, several minutes later after strapping into a seat, Dirk felt the ship lift off the ground. It gradually flew upward, then leaning forward as the captain increased the speed. They rapidly flew off as Dirk was pushed back into his seat, air mana streaming past the wings as if there were invisible thrusters on them. 30, 60, 100, 180, 250, 340, 420. Spike gauged the speed based on the G-force Dirk was experiencing. He was shocked at the numbers. Finally, they settled at around 510 miles per hour. There was a tiny amount of turbulence as they flew, but nothing that shook the ship. Dirk felt weird as he sat in his seat. Do a halo jump out of the side door. No thanks. I don't have a parachute. Maybe when you finish muscle destruction, you can survive terminal velocity falls with your body. Maybe. Dirk smiled a bit as he looked out the window. He could make out vague images of the landscape. Of course, everything was dark, so there wasn't much to see. With that, everyone just had to wait. Their destination was the capital of the Dark Kingdom. Dirk laid his head back to rest, wondering what the place would look like. After the sun rose over the horizon, Dirk felt the airship jolt a bit. They were slowing down. We're making our approach. You should see it. Alec came over as Dirk woke up. Because he had a cloth covering his eyes, nobody could be sure when he was sleeping. Dirk looked like he had been awake for a while when he nodded and walked to the bridge. There, he was able to get a bird's eye view of the capital. Only, when he did, he recoiled in shock. There was a hole. A massive hole that was six entire miles wide. There was a large city built on the land around the hole, and a city floating above the hole. A city around five miles wide was floating above this colossal hole in the ground. From this massive city rose hundreds and thousands of buildings that extended hundreds of meters into the air. There was a tower in the center of this floating city that stood above all, one that rose 1,000 meters in the air, piercing above the clouds. It was blood red in color, looking like a needle. Dirk was baffled by this city that floated above an abyssal pit in the ground that seemed to have no end to its depth. There were also ten bridges that extended across the mile-long gap between the edge of the hole and the city. The airship lowered itself to land near one of these ten bridges. Dirk also saw three utterly massive chains that extended from the thick city platform and anchored it to the walls of the hole, as if to keep it from drifting around. But the floating city wasn't the main reason why Dirk had a violent reaction. The reason for his reaction was due to the horrifying amount of dark mana that bellowed out of the bottomless pit, making it seem like the gateway to hell itself. Luckily, due to the insane amount of dark mana, he could see everything around the hole with shocking clarity using his dark mana sense. Even from so far away, he could see all the short and tall buildings in the floating city. He felt nice, getting such a clear view. The airship quickly descended onto a large platform docking on the hard ground with extended legs. All the soldiers within the ship marched out in formation, placing themselves between the ship and the Dark Kingdom's soldiers that were waiting for them. Then, Duke Kyer stepped out, along with the two Marquises and the delegates. Dirk and Alec walked beside their parents. Dirk could feel Alec's nervousness as he felt the tense atmosphere between the soldiers. A man standing in front of the Dark Kingdom's soldiers looked at Duke Kyer with a smile. He radiated a no less imposing atmosphere than Kyer, though he was shorter so people couldn't help but compare. That person is definitely powerful. Probably as much as the Duke. Dirk thought as the man spoke. 
General Kyer. Her Majesty welcomes you to our dark kingdom. General Salas. It's been fifty years. I'm glad our meeting isn't happening on one of those bridges like before. H.M. General Salas merely let out a humph. His momentary frown only remained for short though as he waved his arm. Allow me to escort you. We have residences prepared for all our honored guests as well as quarters prepared in the outer city for your soldiers. Appreciated. Kyer nodded and walked beside General Salas. The others followed as they went to cross the bridge while the soldiers handled themselves under the directive of a captain. A large carriage was prepared, and the group boarded at the behest of General Salas. Like that, they rode across the mile-long bridge. Dirk looked at the abyssal hole under the bridge, feeling a bit queasy at the supernatural formation. They rode into the so-called Inner City, otherwise known as the Floating City and true capital of the Dark Kingdom. It was completely filled with tall and high-class buildings, and excited people walked the streets making preparations for the coming holiday. The entire place radiated wealth, and despite being called the Dark Kingdom, the city was vibrant with plant life and even native animals. The atmosphere wasn't dreary in the slightest. Dirk was shocked when he even saw mechanical machines in some of the shops and buildings. It seemed almost out of place, the modern hardware that Dirk only knew to exist on Earth. They rode all the way to the massive spire in the center of the city. It was there that they exited the carriage and were led inside. Ascending the tower was done by magic elevators, all of which used dark magic and its spatial aspect. Cecilia didn't seem that surprised by it as if she had experience, but she was still impressed. Gravity magic. Always amazes me. Indeed. Nowhere in the world will you find greater applications of dark magic or smarter practitioners. Hmm. Cecilia didn't deny General Salas's comment. That was a generally agreed-upon fact. The Horizon Empire surely didn't have anything like this. In fact, Dirk was beginning to think that the Horizon Empire was primitive compared to this place. They were on a floating city. Dirk had never seen such fantastical structures in either of his lives. As they rose in the elevator though, Dirk suddenly started to frown. He noticed an odd feeling coming from his soul. It wasn't the eternal pain due to his soul injury. It was something else. Something, familiar, yet foreign. He got a bit restless as they stopped on a particular floor. Chapter 105, Vampire All the honored guests were shown to their temporary residences. Cecilia and Riker, Dirk, Alec and his father, Duke Kyer, and four other delegates. Ten people who represented the Horizon Empire. After being shown to their residences, it was everyone except Dirk, Cecilia, and Alec who left with General Salas. Since they were here, the envoys had no time to waste. Their discussions that would determine the outbreak of war took precedence over any kind of leisure activity or sightseeing. But that didn't concern the three who were left behind. After Cecilia had Alec join her and Dirk, the three left the spire and roamed the city. There were all kinds of preparations being made around the capital city. Decorations and lights were strung up across the buildings, and odd magical objects were scattered across the streets and rooftops. There were also children who held black dragon props that ran through the sidewalks, roaring with childish laughter. Vendors were hawking various wares, most of which were food for the hungry workers. There were also little trinkets, jewelry, and fireworks. Wait! fireworks. Dirk stopped in his tracks when he saw a certain booth. They sold boxes filled with flares and Roman missiles. They were fireworks, and they looked too much like what Dirk remembered from Earth. Even the word firework was directly translated to this world's language. There was one other detail he noticed. It was a name that branded the fireworks. As he walked down the street, Dirk had also paid close attention to the machines. They all had a small brand on them. Pandora. He mumbled the name. He wondered who that was. They seemed to be some kind of scientist. At some point in his staring, Alec came up to him. He only glanced at the fireworks before looking around at the surrounding city. My dad is a vampire. He suddenly spoke, and Dirk turned his head. 
he was only a bit surprised as he remembered the sharp teeth Alec's father exposed while smiling. He even noticed Alec's teeth. They weren't as long, but those canines were definitely sharp. He hadn't seen that a couple of years ago when they were younger. Are you a vampire then? Not purely, but yes. My father says I'm around a quarter vampire. And since my mother is human, I'm majority human. Dirk nodded. The Dark Kingdom. Unlike the Horizon Empire that was dominated by humans, this kingdom was dominated by vampires. Vampires were known for their strong affinity toward the dark element. Likewise, humans had a stronger affinity toward the fire element. Dwarves from the Dwarven Haven had a stronger affinity toward the earth, elves from the World Tree had a stronger affinity toward air, and hybrids from the Unity Empire had a stronger affinity toward water. The World Tree was actually located in the south and southwestern section of the world underneath the Dark Kingdom who was in the direct west. The World Tree was also detached from the hybrid empire unity that occupied the east, separated by a significant distance. Thus it was the Dark Kingdom's vampires that frequently traded with the elves of the World Tree. The two were almost exclusive partners and had a deep commercial and diplomatic bond. It was also why many vampires walking the streets of the city had pointed ears. It was because elves and vampires frequently mated, producing a large mixed population. Though, pure vampires were still the majority in the Dark Kingdom, especially in the capital city. Dirk suddenly asked a question that came to mind. So, since you've got vampire blood, what do you do about, well, blood? Vampires, as their name implied, enjoyed the delicacy that was blood. It was a big reason why the Horizon Empire and the Dark Kingdom didn't have a good relationship, though the main reason was still the wars they fought against each other. Alec answered plainly. There's usually blood in the food I eat. It's not essential though. Even pure vampires like my dad don't absolutely need to intake blood. But he frequently drinks it. There are plenty of strong monsters to obtain blood from, and he's got the money. Sure. But then why is blood important to you guys? It's like a power booster. Alec gave an interesting answer. When a vampire drinks blood, their body is able to steal the blood's vitality. Blood is the medium by which everyone's vital energy is transported. Take the blood, and you take the vitality. Vampires then make it their own. For vampires who train anima, we preferably use powerful blood and bone marrow to enhance our bodies. Normally though, drinking blood can temporarily increase a vampire's power and energy, also giving them greater healing capabilities. It can also replace other forms of sustenance. Because of this, you'll find something called blood potions here. They're potions made with blood as the primary ingredient. They even work on humans, though with lesser effects. Interesting. How much is your power boosted when you drink blood? Depends on the blood, but not by much. If the blood came from a high-tier monster, then it usually gives greater magical abilities. If it came from an anima monster, then it'll increase physical prowess. And, the stronger the blood, the better it tastes, and the better it makes our bodies feel. It simply fills our body with vitality, and everyone likes that. Interesting. Your blood should taste fantastic in that case. Spite chuckled a bit, causing Dirk to smirk. Dirk had gone through blood destruction and his mana hearts pumped mana into his bloodstream. There was also that enhancement with Master Xing's experimental potion, replacing Dirk's human blood with something else similar to a dragon's. His blood had been strengthened several times over. Thinking that, Dirk made sure never to let a vampire taste his blood. They might want all of it. So do you only get blood from monsters or do you prefer human blood? That's a dangerous question. Why? It's a taboo subject. I've never actually had human blood before, and my father has made me promise never to drink any, not that I want to. To many humans, vampires are parasites, so he always tried to make sure that we weren't seen that way. Though, that's also the reason he's a Marquis. Should he be a higher noble? He's a rank 8, so he should be a duke. Wow. Dirk couldn't help his surprise. He didn't realize that Alec's father was so strong. 
Could he go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Azura? Alex sighed. But because it's a human empire, there are many who don't like him, and he can't become a duke. I thought power was supposed to surpass the words of the weak. It does, but being a duke in the Horizon Empire means more than just being a high noble. It's a major position of power that makes you a pillar of the empire, one of its greatest protectors. It's unfortunate, but one's race can't be ignored when making someone a pillar. Still, my father and the emperor have a great standing with each other. It's just unsuitable for my father to become a duke, and he's never pushed for the position on purpose. Instead, the two cooperate commercially. My father controls a major portion of the empire's industry. He also does things like this. Being an envoy? Yes. Alec nodded with a faint smile, proud of his father's strength and achievements. Dirk was confused though. Why does your father do it though? He could come here and be a pillar of the Dark Kingdom. I'm not exactly sure why. I've asked him the same thing. He tells me that his allegiance lies with the Horizon Empire, or more specifically, Emperor Horizon. The two cooperate a lot, so I guess they're friends. Wow. Even though you're not the son of a duke, you're still a serious crystal spoon noble. Indeed. It's a very lavish lifestyle. I enjoy it whenever I can. Heh. Dirk chuckled as Alec shamelessly agreed. Still, Dirk found Alec's father's position interesting. A vampire who was friends with the emperor and swore allegiance to a human empire. Now, he was here negotiating with vampires on behalf of the humans. It was odd. By the way. I've heard some interesting things about the royalty here. Like? Dirk listened in when Alec changed topics. He pointed to the logo on the fireworks. That name, Pandora. Apparently she's a princess, the third child and daughter of the Vampire Queen. She's become famous in recent years, but I guess she's always been a bit peculiar. My father says that she's one of the reasons for the recent big shift in the Dark Kingdom's standing. She's also supposed to be our age. Someone our age is shifting an entire empire's political and military stance. She sounds dangerous. And impressive. That too. Why can't you do that? How would I? I can't even think of something I could do to cause such change. And I don't have the ability to do anything revolutionary. Alec shrugged his shoulders as the two walked. Dirk smiled a bit, the two bouncing between topics as they wandered the city. All they could do is wander though. Since the Horizon Empire and the Dark Kingdom might be going to war soon, the Horizon currency was worthless in this place. They couldn't buy food or items for the upcoming festival. But they didn't need to either. After Cecilia met back up with them, they all returned to the spire. There, they got some room service and were able to be served food. After that, they spent the rest of the day hanging around. Dirk found himself looking out his window and at the surrounding city. He worked on sharpening his long-distance black and white vision. It got better by the day. Come night though, Dirk was greeted by a maid. She requested that they do a clothing selection for the next day. He didn't mind and a whole group of people came in with racks of clothes. All the clothes were luxurious, and it didn't seem like the Dark Kingdom intended to embarrass their guests with a bad selection. The four women all looked at Dirk and took in his shape and stature before grabbing vests, blazers, pants, shoes, shirts, and even hats to try on. Dirk quickly became a dress-up doll as they sought to make him look perfect. Handsome, sharp, and elusive. This was how they described his look, and they giggled whenever they made adjustments and took in his entire form. Dirk just smiled as they had their fun. He followed along and changed into whatever they wanted. He also chuckled when they went to remove his blindfold only to see the cursed cracks and put it back in apology. Sometimes Dirk looked in the mirror and was impressed as he got glimpses of his own look with his sharpening black and white vision. Dirk didn't dress up at all, so this was a nice change in pace. But the women were good at their job, and as women themselves, they knew what they liked. They made adjustments and Dirk was surprised as his look became more refined. Tight clothes that showed off his muscles, but also made him seem a bit loose and free. 
After two hours of playing dress up, they made a decision. Black pants, black shirt, and a dark red vest that had intricate black designs on it. After leaving some of his chest exposed with the shirt, they trimmed his hair a bit and combed it back. As for Dirk's skin, it was perfect from skin destruction, so there was no makeup or blemish hiding they needed to do. Slipping on a pair of black shoes and rolling up the sleeves, the women took a step back. There wasn't a lot on Dirk, just his clothes, but he looked sharper than ever. As they said, less is more. They even swapped the blindfold for something nicer than a torn piece of cloth. The four were satisfied, and after stripping off the clothes, they promised to be back tomorrow afternoon before the ball started. Dirk was a bit surprised as they walked out. And as they left, Cecilia walked in. She watched the four women exit before looking at Dirk's combed back hair. Your hair looks good. Thanks. Did you like how they dressed you? I was dressed up rather nicely considering the tensions between our empires. I liked it. I've never looked so proper before. Dirk smiled while taking a seat. H.M., I wish I saw it before they left. Oh well, it'll be a nice surprise. Anyway, we have something we need to do. I've never actually taught you this, and it's last minute, but I'm sure you'll do fine. Cecilia walked over as she said that, standing in front of Dirk. You heard about the ball? Yes. Do you know what people do at a ball? No. Dirk answered honestly. Not in his past life or this one had he ever participated in a ball. He had no idea what people did there. Everyone who will be at this ball are the highest echelons of the Dark Kingdom. Royalty, politicians, dukes, generals, merchants, artisans, and the most powerful individuals this empire can muster. Disregarding why we're here, there's usually three things everyone does when in the presence of such powerful people. They network, they drink, and they dance. You won't be doing the first thing, so you'll need to learn how to do the other two. I need to learn how to drink. People criticize everything, Dirk. From your walk, to your voice, to the way you sit. For royalty, everything must be refined, even the way they hold cups in their hands and how much they sip at a time with each tilt of the glass. I'll teach you how to carry yourself with manners in such a setting. But first, you need to learn to dance. Okay. But who would I be dancing with? I know nobody here. Oh, you innocent child. I'm glad you're not so self-aware of your devilish looks. Cecilia ruffled his hair with a smile. Dirk tilted his head. Innocent? He was the farthest thing from naive and innocent. From his perspective, of course. Dirk, you're at a ball where all the teenagers your age are looking to enjoy their night. Girls are going to find the cutest or hottest man, so any girl that wants to dance with you is going to do so because she's interested in you. Now, a romantic interest doesn't mean they hope to marry you. They just want to take you to bed for the night. And because of that, I want you to reject all the girls you dance with. Nothing goes beyond the dance floor. Understood? All right. Dirk nodded oddly. Cecilia smiled as she tapped his nose. Anyway, I still need to teach you how to dance, since you will be dancing. Will I? It's basically guaranteed. Anyway, sharpen up, pretty boy. Keep up and I'll teach you the steps as we go. The manners can come later. Saying that, Cecilia grabbed Dirk's hands and started leading. Dirk fumbled around for a bit before catching her rhythm. After that, he stepped as he was told, learning the moves of the dance. This dancing lesson lasted well into the night. Cecilia had fun as Dirk caught on quick, the two moving faster and faster as she challenged his footwork. It was only when Riker arrived that the two eventually stopped. He smiled as he saw his son learning to dance and having fun, but unfortunately he wasn't in a position to just sit back and enjoy a show. Cecilia, we need to talk. Hmm. I'll teach you manners tomorrow then, Dirk. Teach Dirk manners? I personally feel a bit of rugged etiquette has its own charm. It's not good to be so uptight and stiff all the time. You just get shaky when you're nervous, honey. I spilled my drink once, dear. And I thought it was cute. 
Cecilia chuckled as she pat Riker's cheek, the two leaving Dirk's room. Dirk had a weird smile before getting ready for bed, 